Okay, so I think we can start. Um, I'd just like to ask you two things. Uh, please uh, leave your uh, microphone um, uh, muted during the presentation. And if you have questions, I also kindly ask you to uh, to ask your questions at the end of the presentation, or you can also write them in the chat. Uh, so I think it will be a bit a bit easier for everyone this way. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name my name is uh, Felipe Andrade. Uh, I work at Dynamore, and today's topic will be uh, an overview of failure damage models uh, that we have in LS Dyna. And as the title says, uh, it will be a short overview, so we won't have uh, all the details. But just to give you an idea of what we have in LS Dyna, what we don't. And perhaps uh, this can help you in deciding uh, which way you want to go when it comes to the modeling of failure uh, in Alastina. So to start with, um, um, let's just talk a little bit about uh, failure prediction because if you uh, if you want to use a failure or damage model uh, in Alastina, it means that you want to predict failure in your simulation. So. Um, it's important to remember that the failure behavior, uh, it depends on, uh, on many, many things, many factors that will influence uh, the prediction of your uh, material failure. And this includes uh, plastic strain, um, ductile uh, failure will be induced by plastic strain that happens before the failure. You have um, also things like the stress state. Uh, it means that if you have tension or compression or shear, your material will uh, behave differently uh, regarding failure. Then you also have uh, the strain path or the load path that your uh, material undergoes, which means that um, if, for instance, if you have first tension and then you have shear up to fracture, you will have a certain plastic strain at time of failure. But if you reverse that, uh, that, that, that load path, uh, you might get, or typically you get a different plastic strain uh, at failure in the end. So the history of your loading, uh, it's important when it comes to, to failure. Yeah. Under certain uh, stress states, for instance, uh, tensile stress states, you also have uh, localization in ductile materials, which means that your material will neck or uh, will experience a thinning before it fails. So it also uh, plays a role in the failure uh, description or prediction. Then you have things like strain rate, uh, different strain rates, your material might behave differently uh, or <laughs> anisotropic behavior <laughs> that you might have. <laughs> There's... Okay, please mute your microphones. Um, okay, um, and... Um, <clears throat> Yes, and also anisotropy may also play a role um, when it comes to the material uh, failure prediction. Yeah, and the choice of which model you're going to use in the end, um, it depends on many things, but I think uh, globally thinking about that, uh, it depends a lot on the application that you have, if it's fresh, if it's forming operations, if it's something else, um, and also on the desired accuracy. If you want to be more accurate, you will, you will need more sophisticated, more complex models. If you are okay with less accuracy, uh, less accuracy, you can also use simpler models. Um, here on the right, I have two examples which are coming from real projects that we had in the past. Uh, the top picture here, it's uh, aluminum extrusion, uh, which we characterized and uh, also simulated uh, in LS Dyna. Here have like a three-point bend uh, hardware test that we did and, and the simulation to that. Um, here's a dual phase steel. Um, it's a profile, actually a symmetrical profile, which is welded to each other. And then you also have here a, a, a bending uh, situation where you also had the failure. And in both these cases here, we were working uh, with Gizmo, which is one of the failure and damage models that we have in Alastina, probably one of the most popular one. Um, um, nowadays in Alastina. Yeah. And as you've seen here, we are always talking here about failure and or damage models. Uh, and there's a reason to that. And the reason is that, well, there's one way that you can uh, use to categorize uh, things or classify things when it comes to, uh, to the modeling strategy. And one way is to call it a failure model. 
where the failure model, well, it has a failure variable which indicates uh, when the onset of failure will happen. But that it's not really the main characteristic of this kind of a strategy. Basically, a failure model uh, is understood when you have no effect on material stiffness or strength. So you have your plasticity model and everything's working. And, uh, uh, and on top of that, you have the failure model, which is actually parallelly uh, uh, being calculated, uh, but it's, it's uncoupled from your, from your material behavior itself, from plasticity, so to speak. Um, when it comes to failure models, there are very, some of them are very simple. Uh, some of them are a little bit more complex. Some of them are incremental. Uh, others are not incremental. Why is that important? Well, um, just mentioned uh, before that uh, the, the, uh, the loading history, yeah, the strain path that you might follow, um, it plays a role in, in, in um, inner material of failure prediction and incremental models tend to be much more uh, accurate uh, in that regard. So uh, it's an important characteristic actually. Failure models are generally simpler than damage models. So it will be easier also to calibrate them. You have um, typically less parameters to identify directly from experiments. And damage models uh, would be a little bit different. Well, you still have a variable which will act as an indicator for the failure onset, but that variable is also the damaging, so to speak, of the material. It's, it's intended to be like that. But one main difference to a failure model would be that the damage model will affect your material stiffness or strength yeah, throughout the formation. Damage models are typically incremental. I think most of them are incremental. They are generally more complex than failure models. So they are also more sophisticated in the general sense, which also means that they typically need more parameters uh, to be identified from experiments. So here you are getting more complex, more sophisticated, but also uh, it, it has a certain cost uh, related to that. And interestingly enough, some models, for instance, Gizmo, it can be uh, it can be actually a failure and damage model uh, simultaneously. Um, it, yeah, we were going to see that later on. Um, when you're talking, or Alistair, at least, uh, when you're using either a failure or damage model, normally uh, you have, will have some element erosion after the failure criterion is reached. Yeah? So the element would really get deleted. Um, in some cases, you can turn that off. In some cases, you can't. Um, yeah, so it depends a little bit, but generally you will have some element erosion. Uh, so it's a visual indicator that failure has happened. And also, generally speaking, incremental models tend to be more accurate because they can consider non-proportional load. It is when you have a uh, different loading path throughout your deformation, uh, it can account for that. Yeah. So it would tend to be um, more accurate. Now, it doesn't matter if you use a failure damage model in LSD. I know there are two kinds of implementation right now. Uh, the one is when the failure or damage model is embedded in the material model. Um, so plasticity and failure are treated through the same keyword, let's say uh, star mat something like, uh, for instance, mat 24, if you have the flag fail, uh, it's a very simple failure criterion, which is embedded in mat 24. And there are many other examples like uh, Matt, Matt Johnson Cook, uh, Gerson, Plasticity with Damage, Damage One, and so on. So many of them, uh, they, they are like that. So you have Plasticity and in the same keyword, you have to define your failure uh, model or your damage model. Yeah, so they are not uncoupled. So for instance, if you want to use Johnson Cook failure model uh, together with uh, a uh, an isotropic material model for plasticity. Right now, uh, it's difficult to do that uh, in Elastina or not using this uh, kind of uh, implementation. So that's why we also have the modular structure uh, through the keywords that begin uh, generally with mat add. So basically, what you can do is you have your plasticity model, yeah, and then you add to that through a new keyword you add your failure or your damage model. So typical examples are the keywords mat at erosion or mat at damage gizmo, mat at damage DM or mat at generalized damage. So using those keywords, you can... Um, uh, okay, nice to this. Okay, sorry. 
Um, yeah, so you can add uh, uh, um, uh, your um, uh, your failure or damage model through uh, an additional keyword. Yeah, so uh, that's basically the idea of that. Um, and, and, and the link between the plasticity and the failure model or the damage model is done if you use exactly the same material ID. So if it's material ID 10 in your MAT24 and then use the same ID for your uh, MAT and erosion, for instance. So that's, that's the way of doing this. Um, the advantage of using these strategies is that it gives you more, much, much more freedom. So if you want to use a more sophisticated, um, more sophisticated um, uh, material model for plasticity, uh, you can still use, let's say, Gizmo with that. Okay, so uh, that would be the uh, the main advantage of using this. So. I think uh, we can see that more and more customers are really preferring using the modular structure than using um, the material model that um, are you, are you there? Mike, <laughs> do you hear me? Okay, Mike doesn't hear me. Okay, so, uh, okay, so let's take a look at failure models first. Uh, it's just an overview uh, of the of some of the models that we have in Elastina. Not all of them will be um, uh, uh, listed here, but I just have here, uh, yeah, an overview of some typical failure models that we can see in Elastina. For instance, um, in MET24, we have a very simple uh, failure criterion based on the equivalent plastic strain. Um, it's very, very simple, but somewhat also popular, I think, because it's very easy to use. There's just one entry in your keyword and you're done. You can work with that. Then you have MAT123, which is basically an enhancement of MAT24 regarding uh, failure criteria. You have, uh, apart from the equivalent plastic strain, you have the thinning strain and, and the major strain. Then you have, for instance, uh, the Johnson Cook models, which are also very popular, especially in the in the aviation industry. Um, you can make it dependent on the strain rate, on the temperature, and as also on the triaxiality. Um, there are some other criteria like the cocroft latham criterion or the Bresson-Williams criterion, um, which are, for instance, embedded in MET 135, but not only, some other models also have these two criteria embedded in them. And finally, you have uh, MET add erosion, which is a modular concept. So you can add your failure criteria uh, to existing material models. And I think it's always important to, um, to, 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 uh, to mention that some of these criteria uh, here, they can be reproduced by either GISM or TM for MET add erosion, for instance, which means that if you want to work with Johnson Cook, but you want to work uh, with a material model, that doesn't have that as a failure model embedded in the material uh, implementation. Um, it's not a problem. You can use Gizmo to reproduce Johnson Cook, Johnson Cook as well. So um, first one here, I have uh, MET24 with the fail flag. Uh, again, it's a very simple criterion um, using MET24. Uh, basically, it's the equivalent plastic strain at the time of failure. And basically what happens is uh, it doesn't matter what is the stress state, the equivalent plastic strain will be compared to that value. If that value has been breached, then the integration point will fail. Yeah. But uh, you have to remember that, um, or it's important to mention here that the element erosion, if, if the shell element, only happens if all integration points fulfill the criteria. Yeah. So it means if only a few of them has have fulfilled this, this criterion, the element will not get eroded. We already got a few, quite a few times uh, this question in our support. Uh, I have reached this uh, plastic strain at failure at a certain time, but the element did not get deleted. Why? Uh, because sometimes what happens is that you do reach most of the integration points, points within the element, uh, you reach that criteria, but some of them do not really reach that value. And uh, for instance, you have a lot of bending or so, you might create a plastic hinge and that plastic hinge uh, prevents the element to be further uh, deformed. So you never really reach that uh, for all integration points at the same time. Uh, 
uh, and the consequence is that you don't see the element uh, erosion, the element getting deleted. So um, it's a drawback, let's say here, of this criterion as well. But again, it's a very, very simple criterion. Um, for the general case, I would not recommend using this. Uh, it can be used as a workaround for some situations. Uh, but in the general case, I would not recommend that criterion. Uh, it is not incremental, so it doesn't matter what the history, uh, the loading history was before uh, that value has been reached. When that value has been reached, uh, it will fail and period. So uh, it's also a further limitation um, of this criterion. Then we have in uh, MAT123, uh, we it's basically a copy of MAT24 with some more uh, options uh, regarding the failure. Uh, we have here the equivalent plastic strain and failure, the, the fail flag as just at MAT24, but we also have the thinning strain at failure and the major in-plane strain at failure. Um, these two criteria, they are a little bit better, let's say, than this one, because this one here does not regard its extension compression, it's always the same. Um, those two, although you only input here one single value, they will inherently consider some uh, stress state dependence. You can imagine like this, imagine thinning. Yeah, if you have a uh, uniaxial tension situation, uh, you will have thinning. But if you have shear, there's no thinning. Yeah, so there will be no thinning strain under shear. So this criteria will never be reached uh, or, or fulfilled uh, under shear but it will eventually be fulfilled and then tension. So as you can see, you already have some differentiation between the different stress states, which is a good thing, but you have to remember that you can only enter here a single value. So uh, let's say this, the characteristic of the stress state dependence of this criterion, or even of the uh, major strain criterion, it's already given and you can't not change that. So it's a kind of a limitation of those two criteria. Um, both of them are also not incremental. So for nonlinear strain paths, uh, they are also quite uh, limited. Uh, but more interesting than MAT24, you also have here a flag called NUMINT. And NUMINT defines how many integration points have to fail before the element is deleted. So in that sense, you can avoid that situation where many integration points have actually reached your failure criterion, but the element does not get deleted. You can always, use a value here, which is a little less than the number of integration points in your element. In that way, you can uh, make sure that uh, the element will at some point get uh, deleted. Uh, so as you can see, um, MET123, it's a little bit more sophisticated than MET24, but still quite simple. And finally, we have here uh, the MET at erosion keyword where we have several simple failure criteria. Um, I will not go through all of them, but we have things like effective strain at failure, volumetric strain at failure, uh, the maximum principle strain at failure, and so on. Um, all these criteria are not incremental. They are also very simple. Yeah? Some of them inherently contain some kind of stress state dependence. Some of them don't. Um, so uh, it, it's up to you to decide which one you want to use. One interesting thing here is that uh, you have this flag called NCS, which means a number of criteria satisfied or so. So basically, uh, this uh, if you by, by default, you have one. So if you have here more than one criterion which has been uh, selected, as soon as one of them has been uh, reached, uh, then you have failure. If you set, for instance, here in this example two, both these criteria have to be satisfied before the element is deleted and so on. So this can be sometimes a little bit interesting to play with the different criteria at the same time. On the other hand, I have to say that um, there are not many customers working with this kind of modeling nowadays, uh, or at least I, I don't see that uh, actually often or very, very, it's very, very seldom to see anyone using this kind of uh, approach with different criteria at the same time. It's not impossible, you can do it. Um, but again, you have certain limitations, for instance, like um, all these criteria are non-incremental. And as I mentioned before, to activate this, you have, for instance, your MAT24 keyword with a certain material ID, uh, and you just use the same material ID here, uh, and then you will activate uh, the, the, the MAT erosion keyword. So it, it will know it belongs to that uh, 
material model. So we saw here uh, a few criteria that are quite simple. They are not incremental. Uh, they are very simple to define. You can just use here a single value. And then uh, I will present shortly two criteria which are incremental, but they are failure criteria. Um, first one is the Johnson Cook failure criterion. As I said before, it's quite popular in the aviation industry, uh, I believe because it has uh, strain rate dependence and temperature dependence. Uh, uh, it's important for them to have this kind of dependencies. Uh, and basically it's a little bit more sophisticated. You have here a fracture strain, which is a function of the strain rate, the temperature, and the so-called stress triaxiality. And if you never heard uh, from that before, uh, of that before, uh, the stress triaxiality just tells you, it's an indicator for the stress state, if it's tension, compression, shear, biaxial tension, and so on. So basically this criteria gives you some more freedom uh, to define what is the uh, behavior throughout the different stress states. Although it always, it's always monotonic, or basically it always have this, has the same shape. Uh, this function will always have the same shape. It's an exponential function. Uh, so this is somewhat also a certain limitation of the Johnson-Cook model. But a further thing uh, in the Johnson-Cook model is that you have a variable, okay, which is typically called damage, it's a failure variable, and it's accumulated throughout the formation history in a very simple manner. For every plastic increment of plastic strain, uh, there will be an increment of this damage variable and failure or fracture will occur when damage is equal to one. Yeah. So this curve here that I plotted, is basically just the, yeah, it's the reference that we have uh, for constant triaxialities, for constant stress states. If the stress state is the different one, it's nonlinear, then basically uh, the damage accumulation here will uh, be active and it will only fail if it reaches the value one. So it's more sophisticated than the previous criteria that I showed you before. You can use this model either through MET15 or 107, but it, it, this can also be fully reproduced by Kismore DM through method erosion or even in MET224, which is called uh, MET tabulated Johnson Cook. Uh, you can actually uh, reproduce Johnson Cook if you input the correct curve there. Um, so there's uh, some freedom in that regard. So the Johnson-Cook model is a little bit more sophisticated uh, than the other ones. Um, and finally, uh, I have one criteria here, which is uh, kind of getting more popular over the last years. It's the cocroft latent failure criterion, actually a quite old uh, idea from 1968. And basically what these uh, authors proposed was that you make an integral uh, of the maximum of the first principal stress and zero. So you are only considering uh, principal stresses which are positive. Yeah? And you do that through your plastic deformation. And that uh, integral is a value called W. And if that W uh, reaches a certain critical value, WC, uh, then it will fail. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting criterion because uh, it inherently also uh, includes the dependence of the stress states through uh, the usage here of the maximum uh, or the first principal stress. Uh, it also has an interesting feature that it does uh, everything throughout uh, or using the increments of plastic strain. So it, it, it is incremental. Uh, uh, it is an incremental criterion and this gives you some more, um, um, yeah, it's it's more realistic, so to speak. It's more sophisticated, it's more realistic. And interestingly enough, it only requires one value, which is this critical uh, value of W. Um, because here you have a, uh, a stress in your uh, equation, this value here is actually, uh, it has a unit. It, it will be pascals or megapascals or so on. So if you change the units of your, a model, you have to change that as well. Um, it doesn't happen to the other, to many of the other criteria which are strain-based, uh, then you, you don't have to change the unit, but here you do have to change the unit. The unit here is a uh, stress unit. This criteria in the meantime is available in more than one material model in Elastina. Uh, I have here one of the examples, it's MET-135. It's actually an, uh, an anisotropic material model, which can also uh, be so, you can also, uh, set up your input so that you have a purely uh, isotropic model and still use that criterion. Uh, 
but again, it's just one of the examples where you can use it uh, right now in LS Dyna. Yeah, and again, I, I have it here also because it's it seems that it's gaining more popularity, I believe, because of this uh, easiness of use. And actually, it's not that bad if you think about that, uh, or if you, or some, yeah, some investigations have shown that this criterion, uh, it's not really that bad. It can make some interesting predictions. All right, so these were just an, uh, was just an overview of some of the failure models that we have, or typical failure models in LS Dynam. Then I have here uh, also a short overview about damage models uh, that we have in LS Dynam. I have here uh, an overview of them. Um, if you read uh, the theory uh, or the literature regarding damage models, there's a lot of papers out there, a lot of publications. Uh, but I think, uh, at least in my experience, there are two families of models which are quite popular uh, in the literature, which are um, the, the, the models based on the, on the mattress model. Uh, it's, it's a damage model where you have um, really the evolution of the damage, which also affects uh, the material stiffness, it affects uh, the, the elastic response. And so if it's more and more damaged then uh, the material uh, degrades, something that you have there. So uh, if you want to work with, uh, with, uh, with the Lemaitre model, there are quite a few options in LS Dyna. They are called Mad Damage 1, 2, and Three, so they are basically uh, Lemaitre-based damage models that you can have in LS Dyna. Um, another family of damage models, which are also quite popular, are the Gerson-based models. Um, Gerson uh, made his model, I think, in the 70s, 1977. Uh, it considered that the material uh, has some porosities inside, and there's a volume of that those porosities. So he based his all all his theory on that. This model has been extended many times uh, in the literature. Many people made some enhancements. And some of those extensions and enhancements, they are also uh, available in LS Dyna um, through uh, some of our material models. They generally start with Matt Gerson. Yeah, so we have here Matt Gerson, Matt Gerson JC, or Matt Gerson RC DC. Some of those extensions are also um, present there. And then we have um, some modular damage and failure models in LS Dyna, which are also quite popular. For instance, Gizmo. Gizmo was developed uh, 15 years ago, more or less. Um, and originally it was uh, only available through metal erosion. There was a flag called IDEM. Still, we still have the flag. And if you set this to one, then you have Gizmo activated um, in your model. And just like the uh, other simple failure criteria, just use the same material ID here, and you have Gizmo activated for your underlying plasticity model. The same thing happens with DM. Uh, I think it's a little bit older than Gizmo, the formulation. Um, use the same flag, but now use a negative value to activate it. Um, it's also used by some customers, uh, this, 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 this damage model. Uh, and uh, yeah, so. It, it depends a little bit uh, on, 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 on your modeling philosophy, how, how you want to do that, if you want to use Gizmo or TM. Um, one important information is that from LS Dino release 11, uh, you also have these two possibilities for the input when regard, uh, regarding Gizmo and TM. And now you can also use the keyword MAT add damage Gizmo or MAT add damage DM. Uh, the old keywords, they still exist, they will ever exist, okay? So this year, it's just, a, it's just the input is more comfortable for the user. So it's easier to, um, to, to, to input your uh, uh, things uh, using these two keywords. That's one point. And the second point is uh, newer features will actually only be added uh, uh, using these this keywords. So, Right now we get uh, some requests every now and then uh, for uh, some uh, enhancement of Gizmo or some extension of Gizmo. Um, and uh, most of those enhancements and new options, they are now only present in this keyword here. 
Yeah, so some of the newest features will only be available in newer versions of LS Dyna and only through this keyword. So if you already have uh, a bunch of Gizmo material cards from the past, you don't have to convert them to this input. But if you make a new one and you're using uh, LS Dyna release 11 or, or, or newer, uh, then I would recommend to switch to that one when you make a new material card. And there's of course no problem in LS Dyna if some materials have met the erosion, some others met at the damage keys or TM. It's really, really doesn't matter. You can use both of them at the same time. We also have uh, a model that we call the e gizmo So it's like the extended gizmo. Uh, it's, uh, you can access that model through met at generalized damage. Basically it's gizmo, but you can define more than one damage variable at the same time. You can make it depend on different history variables. You can make it, uh, for instance, to uh, describe uh, orthotropic materials like metal sheet or so. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility in this model. Uh, so it might be interesting to, to take a look, but it's of course, uh, it's more complex than Gizmo is still, or more complex than DM because of its flexibility, but you have many, many options that you can do that. And finally, you have some other damage models that, um, do not necessarily, uh, yeah, uh, fit in this kind of category categorization here, like plasticity with damage or simplified damage. Uh, these are not based on a GERS model, a metro model. So these are different damage models, and the choice of them will depend on a lot of things, of course. Um, but yes, so this is more or less the overview of those different models. I will not talk about all of them. I will just talk a little bit about it perhaps the two, two more, most popular ones, I will talk a little bit about Gizmo. Um, Gizmo stands for the, for Generalized Incremental Stress State Dependent Model. So it's an acronym coming from those letters. That's why it's called Gizmo. And here we have a quite, uh, uh, yeah, quite overview what, whatever, what it can do and how it works. I will not go into every detail uh, here. It's just a short overview, but basically you have one failure curve that you have to define in Gizmo, it's dependent on the stress reactiality represented here by eta. Um, and then that curve is used here uh, to calculate the damage value. So this damage value is calculated using this failure curve. And failure will be achieved whenever you have damage equal to one. So uh, here I have a, 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 some three examples where you see Reactiality is not constant, so you have a non-linear strain path and a non-linear or non-proportional loading. So as you can see here, those points, they are not failing on the failure curve. That's not a mistake. It's intended to be like that. The failure curve is just a reference from when or for when the triaxiality remains constant. If it's not constant, it will fail somewhere else. This is intentional, and the idea behind this is to account for non-proportional loading. What you can also do in Gizmo is, uh, but it's not mandatory, uh, you can use an instability curve and that instability curve will be basically a trigger for uh, some strain softening. Yeah, so here we have just one picture. The star here represents the point when the instability has been reached. And when it, it has been reached, the stress can now uh, fade out uh, with respect to the plastic strain. And you can control that fading out uh, through this exponent m. So it's a parameter that you can, can um, that you can uh, uh, calibrate, or you have to calibrate, so to speak, if you use, uh, let's say, the instability curve. But again, it's not mandatory. If you leave the instability curve, uh, if you just don't use it, you will just have your failure curve, and Gizmo will behave like a failure model, purely failure model. And if you have a failure a stability curve like this one, at some points you will have the coupling, so it will be like a damage model. But here, for instance, in that stress state, you don't have any damaging, so it will behave like a failure model. So Gizmo, it's a kind of a mixed model. And as you can see here, uh, from all the equations and possibilities, of it's of course um, more sophisticated than the other models that we uh, saw in the previous slides. And finally, we also have here DM, and DM stands for Damage Initiation and Evolution Model. Um, it's a different philosophy uh, than Gizmo, but it has some similarities. But basically, if you would take, for instance, here, uh, 
tensile test, what happens is that um, here's the engineering stress strain curve from that tensile test. There's first one part where we have a so-called damage initiation. And during that damage initiation, uh, the model will be like a failure model. So there's no influence of the damage on the stress. And when the critical value of the damage initiation uh, variable has been reached, uh, when it reached one, then we start the second phase of your model, which is the damage evolution. And the damage evolution will affect your uh, stresses so that you have some softening. And the failure will happen when that damage uh, evolution variable, D, reaches the value one. So in this part of the model, you have some kind of a damage model. In this part of the model, it's, it's like a failure model. And for instance, this damage evolution can be controlled through this uh, variable Q1. And if Q1, for instance, is zero, then there will be no damage evolution and TM will be a purely failure model. Yeah. So, so you can kind of calibrate the way it's more appropriate for your problem. One main difference of TM with regards to Gizmo is that it has different or several uh, criteria, uh, criteria for the damage initiation, which will uh, just, they will just be computed parallel to each other. So you have a ductile failure criterion based on the triaxiality. You might have a shear criterion based on the stress, shear stress function, or even instability based on the, uh, on the, on, on the ratio of the deviatoric stresses. You don't have to use all of them, but you can. And I think the basic or the, the, the original idea of the model was to use all of them at the same time. So they represent different uh, failure mechanisms. So you have the choice, actually, you have this flexibility in LS9. You can use either just one or all of them or two. It just depends on how you interpret the model and how you want to, to, to calibrate it. So it's, it's a different philosophy to Gizmo, but as you can see here, it also has some complexity. Uh, and a lot of flexibility as well uh, when it comes to uh, the failure modeling. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, uh, just to give you an idea what model to choose and what, how to do it, I have here just one example of a dual phase steel. This is a real material that we tested. And basically, here I'm comparing four models. I chose them because they are all different. I have these. Equivalent plastic strain from uh, from MAT24, a very simple failure criterion. I have the cocroft Layton criterion, which is a more sophisticated failure model. I have the Gerson-based model, which is uh, its damage model itself, yeah, but with sometimes certain limitations. And I also have Gizmo, which is at the same time a failure and damage model. And as I said before, you have a lot of flexibility with Gizmo. Uh, you can define a failure curve, and the failure curve is uh, it's a, it's a really a load curve. You can use just defined curve in ls and set up the curve the way you need it to be set up, to be calibrated. So here, uh, what I did was basically, uh, it's not difficult to calibrate all of these models to reach here, let's say, uh, failure at the same point in a tensile test. So all of them here are equally good or equally bad. Uh, when it comes to the tensile test. It gets interesting when you use that calibration to the other stress states. And as you can see here, for instance, in the shear case, um, the equivalent strain is uh, its not really able to describe the, the, the point of failure here. In the shear test, neither the Coker of Latham model, it's also underestimating the failure. Uh, with Gizmo, because of the complexity and the, level and the freedom that we have with the parameters, you can actually uh, calibrate your model to fail correctly under shear. The same thing here happens also with the Gerson-based model. If you look at the notched test, um, well, the plastic strain and uh, the cocroft Layton are overestimated a little bit, that test. So as you can see here, there's no clear tendency that the equivalent plastic strain uh, criteria will always underestimate or always overestimate. It, it doesn't work like that, yeah? And those mismatches are coming simply from the fact that this failure criterion is actually too simple if compared to the real materials that we had. And finally, we have here one equibiaxial test where we, again, we can hear, uh, because we have the flexibility of the load curve, we can match that model again. Uh, with Gizmo and with the other models. 
we have uh, a mismatch and uh, for instance the equivalent plastic stream model you, you cannot do anything about that you have to live with that mistake or with that mismatch because you only have one parameter that you can calibrate the same thing also happens with the cocroft bacon criterion uh, you just have one parameter that you can calibrate so if you have a mismatch here but a match there there's basically not, not nothing you can do. You can try to match this one here, but most probably you won't match that one. The Gerson based model is a little bit more flexible, but not flexible enough in this case. I really tried to get a, the best calibration possible, but I simply could not get a solution where I could also um, describe the failure in the Quibia by actual test correctly. So in essence, as you can see here, Gizmo would be, for instance, in this case, a more complex model. It requires more testing, uh, but it's able to uh, to to really uh, match the failure behavior under different stress states. Um, if you use a simpler model like the equivalent strain uh, um, criterion, as you can see here, you cannot meet, match all of them. But then it's a question again uh, of what is your desired accuracy. If you want Good accuracy, then you need to go for a more complex model like Kismo. If you're uh, okay with less accuracy, uh, and let's say that those mismatches in the equivalent plastic strain, they are more or less okay uh, for you, or, or you can accept them, then you can say, okay, I will use less tests, uh, less effort, a simpler model, and I will work with that. But bearing in mind that I do have um, this kind of mismatch or this kind of problem using those simpler models. So again, it's always a question you you have it's up to you to decide which model uh, you want to use and you want to calibrate. So this was just a, a general overview of our damage and failure models here. I'm basically uh, done, I think, with the most uh, content here. Um, if you want more information, again, it was just a short uh, presentation of this. You can come to a class from Dynamore. We have some of them. Just take a look at our uh, website. You can always come to when one of our conferences. The next one will be in, in Bamberg here in Germany uh, in October. And you can always look for uh, papers from other conferences uh, through dynalook.com. You have a lot of information there regarding the subject of failure. Many people uh, have already published uh, papers in our conferences uh, regarding uh, this topic. And finally, if you say you want to uh, to, to, to get a material card, you don't want to do it yourself, you can always contact us. We have our material competence center. Um, these are the pictures of our colleagues working there making experiments. We have a uh, tensile test machine. We have DAC, uh, DAC equipment. We have a, a pendulum machine and so on. So basically, if you want to get a material card from us, uh, then you just send us the material. We will also cut the specimens for you, we'll make the testing, and we'll generate the material card for you. So um, there's also this possibility as well. Uh, many customers are using this possibility, uh, working with us, um, sending the material and getting the ready material a card in the end of that process. Okay. Um, I would like to thank you for your attention, uh, and uh, if you have questions now, I will uh, be glad to try to answer them. Thank you very much. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, I have a question, and uh, how do you determine the parameters from the experiment for the Gizmo model? Um, <laughs> it's, uh, the question is easily posed, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to answer in a nutshell, but basically what we have is, uh, we have the, um, the failure curve, we have the instability curve, we have the fading exponent. Um, and basically, uh, what we do is, uh, we first identify some, some, uh, reference values, uh, from DAC for the failure curve, for instance, but because the, um, uh, the loading paths here are non-proportional, uh, if you just use those values, you won't get a 100% perfect match. Depends on the material. Some materials will be completely off. Some of them will be quite good. So we do that. And then we do, uh, an identification process 
through some iterations. We iterate this curve in order uh, so that we can at the end, sorry, so that in the end we can get this kind of match here. Yeah. So basically that's the procedure. We do an inverse uh, identification process uh, in order to identify uh, the failure curve, in order to identify the uh, instability curve, and also in order to identify the failing exponent. So it's not very, very simple if you've never done that, but with experience, you get more and more used to that. Yeah. So I think here there's one more question. I'm not sure if you were the person who just asked the question. Ankit Malik. So let me take a look at the chat. Okay. Not sure if you have more questions. We can also write uh, in the chat if you want. What is the difference between failure model and damage model? Um, the main difference is that uh, the damage model uh, would do something like you have here. So here is you have the true stress over the plastic strain and a failure model. If you just take a look at the at the stress, it will the stress will keep uh, increasing, increasing, and it will not decrease, and then will fail abruptly. Yeah. So there's no dissipation on the failing element. So that would be a failure mode in that sense. Yeah. So it, it, the plasticity is just coming as it is with no softening typically. And the damage model, uh, you use the damage variable that you have in order to reduce the stress so that you induce some softening line in this case. So the uh, stress will be decreasing until it fails. Generally, one of the benefits of this damage modeling is that you get a more uh, more ductile response in your model. It's it generally it's a little bit cleaner, yeah. Uh, when when you see the simulation, some especially in ductile materials, ductile materials what we observe in embryo experiments uh, with uh, well, of, of components or so is that typically there is just uh, uh, there are just a few critical uh, spots where the failure takes places takes place and then the damage model can be helpful. So whenever one spot gets critical, it really gets critical and uh, the other ones start to unload, so to speak. So damage models tend to have a more realistic response. Yeah, so I have two questions here. Can you explain the difference between incremental and non-incremental failure? Yeah. Um, incremental failure, as you can see here, um, let's say here, you have here the failure curve, which is the red one. Um, if your model is not, it's incremental, it means that for every uh, increment of plastic strain, it will um, increase a little bit the damage. Yeah? And if you have a perfect constantly uh, stress state, the triaxiality, it will fail exactly on the failure curve. It doesn't matter which triaxiality you take. It will fail exactly there, okay? But if it's not constant, then if something like this happens, it will fail somewhere else in the curve. This sounds perhaps a little bit odd at first, but experiments uh, actually, they, 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 they show evidence of exactly this behavior in reality. So what is the problem? What would happen with a, with a, uh, with a non-incremental model? The non-incremental model you have here, for instance, the failure curve, uh, it doesn't matter uh, for a failure model, let me just change here the color. For the failure model, for the non incremental model, it doesn't matter if you have a constant reaxiality or if you have a nonlinear strain path. It will always fail whenever the curve is reached. Yeah? And this just does not correspond to what we see in experiments. Okay, So you can imagine, for instance, under compression, the damage or the failure uh, accumulation is very low. So some times you have this, uh, for instance, in crash boxes and in, in, in crash simulations, you have a lot of, uh, of plastic strain, but the, 
failure itself is actually not really accumulated. Uh, and then you change the loading type and you go to that point here. So you have a tensile um, behavior. If it's a non-incremental model, it will fail as soon as you reach the curve and it will fail abruptly. If it's an incremental model, up to that point, you have very little damage. So when it got here, it keeps increasing until it fails at a certain point. And this kind of behavior is more realistic. So I would say that non uh, that incremental models are more realistic in the general case. Um, can you please explain how the damage models um, affects, affect strength and stiffness where a failure model doesn't? Um, I think I kind of explained that before. Basically, uh, the failure model will have no interactions whatsoever with the stresses. So it will just be based on the on the strain. And whenever the criterion is met, it will fail abruptly, like this curve here that I drew before. It just fails like that. So there's no dissipation of the stress, so to speak. And the damage model can do that. It will affect your stress. Uh, and in a model like Gizmo, you can even uh, adjust the level of that, uh, of that coupling between the stress and the damage. Are the shell models working for different uh, element types, shell, solids, EFG? Uh, it's a good question. Um, Gizmo is working for shell, solids, and in the meantime, even for beams, although perhaps it doesn't make too much sense, <laughs> but it was a, a request uh, and it works for beams uh, as well. Um, I think that Gizmo also works uh, for some of the different uh, of um, yeah, um, discretization methods. With EFG, I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, I would have to check on that. I think it does because Gizmo is quite popular. Um, and I think some of the other very simple ones, they should also be available in most element types. Yeah. What is your uh -huh. recommendation when working with brittle materials where there is no plasticity, but there's an evolution of damage degradation? Um, it's a good question uh, and uh, diff difficult to answer because um, we have the problem that uh, if you have a brittle material, perhaps I'll find here some place to draw a little bit. Uh, perhaps I can make here a new slide. Uh, just make a new slide here so I can draw a little bit. Um, if you have a brittle material the way how you just mentioned, um, you will have, um, let's say, something like that. Um, let's say, you have some increase of the stress and then it fails. Uh, and as you said, uh, perhaps it doesn't even, I'm sorry, here, this would be sigma. Um, I'm trying hard, today is very bad. Um, yeah, and that would be the strain. So you have up to that point. So if you, as you can see here, uh, the differences in the stresses are much, much higher than the differences in the strain. Um, so it's it's uh, it's it's difficult to 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 consider that. And right now in Elastina, we don't have too many options to work with that. So if you want to work with damage model, uh, with degradation, uh, and only have a purely elastic model, what you can try to do um, is using um, met and generalized damage. Uh, you can take a look at the manual. Uh, it's a bit complicated a model, I know, but um, what you can do there, you can choose uh, any history variable as you want for your damage accumulation. So perhaps you might find a way to couple your, I don't know, some of your history variables, perhaps the, the, the principal strain coming from your model. You can couple that with the damage degradation using met at generalized damage. So perhaps that might be an uh, interesting option to that case. But right now, um, there are no many two options uh, regarding that uh, in Elastina. Let me see if I answered all the questions here. Yeah, at least I answered all of no. Hello. the answers in the chat. Yes, you have a question? Yes, I have a question. Uh, you said that for the strain-based failure, simple strain-based failure, uh, it will uh, check for all the integration points of the elements, right? Then only it will fail. 
You mean in MAT24, right? Yes, 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 MAT24. Yeah, yes. Yes, so uh, for example, if I'm having a shell element, uh, are you speaking about the through thickness integration points or uh, uh, the integration points on the element itself? Um, all, all of them, because if you have, uh, let's say, uh, a shell element of formulation type two, hmm. you have just the through uh, thickness integration points, so let's say five. Yeah. Yeah. So these are the um, the points that uh, where 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 everything is happening. If you have formulation sixteen, which is a yeah fully well, integrated um, uh, element, then you have here four uh, integration points per layer. Yes. And that criteria also needs all integration points per layer to be fulfilled. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. So yes. yes. Again. My big recommendation is that if you want to use a very simple uh, criteria, then I, I, I wouldn't go necessarily for this. Then I, I, I would suggest to add, uh, to use MET and erosion with effective strain and failure. You can also use the plastic part of this. And then here you have this uh, this Q, uh, this flag called NUMFIP. And then you can say, okay, I want just a certain number of integration points to fail or even a percentage of integration points. So let's say 80% of the points have failed then the element is deleted. So I think uh, this would be a more interesting uh, way of doing this than using the fail flag. Yeah. Okay, I, I have one more question. Uh, can you go to uh, that uh, slide where you're expl explaining the failure of Gizmo with uh, the uh, load curve? Yeah, yeah. Same. so yeah, yes, exactly. So here you said that if I have a, a constant uh, failure criterion, then it fails exactly at the failure curve, right? Exactly. Uh, so uh, the uh, and you are showing here that uh, some some points it is failing uh, ab above the curve also. It yeah. is not really reaching there. So uh, does it means that uh, from triaxiality I am uh, I am getting the state of stress and fr from that I am uh, each each uh, steps I am incrementing the plastic strain to failure and once it reaches this point it will fail. Is it like that? Just to keep my understanding correct uh, to check I it out. I, I'm not sure if I understand just completely, but basically what we're doing is here, uh, it's this equation here. Then it's here awesome. I, have the, I have the dot, but you can imagine LS9 is like delta D equal to, so it would take the current reaxiality, uh, the current plastic, uh, the current increment of the plastic strain, and we yes. just evaluate that question and you have a delta D and that delta D is summed up to the current damage. So it will always awesome. be something like, damage plus delta D. And when you do it like this and you enforce that failure only takes place when this value is one, then you have this behavior. If it's non-linear, it will fail somewhere else, either above or below the curve. It depends on the curve, it depends on the strain path. But if you keep the triaxiality perfectly constant, it will fail perfectly on the failure curve. Okay. Understood, understood, yeah. Got it, got it. So you're saying that if I'm if I'm having uh, an, an inc inc incremental method to evaluate the damage, uh, it, it it need not be in a straight line. It can be nonlinear and it will fail in and above the curve, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, actually, actually in reality, all those tests uh, they are always nonlinear in some way. Uh, the tensile test is quite nonlinear after necking point. Even mm -hmm. our shear test is not perfectly uh, linear. I think the most linear one is probably the equibiaxial test. It's quite linear, but it's not perfectly linear, linear as well. So the reality is that non-proportional loading is a reality. It's always happening. It's very difficult yes. to have experiments with linear strain paths. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. And I think now I will close the session. So thank you again and goodbye.